Okay, today I would like to start a new chapter, which is about the electron counting in transition metal complexes. So when you hear the word electron counting, then you may think, well, I can easily count one, two, three, but electron counting in transition metal complexes is actually not as easy as it sounds. There are even two different um, methods to do this. Um, one is called the so-called neutral atom method, and one is called the oxidation method. So each of these two methods lead to the same result. So can you use either of the two? And either of the two are approximately equally um, common in the literature. Therefore, you need to know about both of them. Each of them has certain, uh, well, advantages um, and disadvantages. So whichever one is your favorite really is a matter of, of personal uh, preference, but because they are equally common in the literature, um, you need to know about both of them and you basically have to be able to apply both of them correctly. So what are the two um, um, methods? So the first one is called the neutral atom method. And as the name says, um, we treat um, each fragment in the transition metal complex as neutral fragment and count the electrons of the neutral fragment and then add up the electrons. So that pertains both the transition metal as well as the ligand. So that means that the transition metal is being considered a neutral atom and all the ligands are also considered to be neutral ligands. So what are the exact steps um, that we have to apply in this method? So the first one is that we write down the number of electrons in the neutral atom valence shell, which corresponds to the group number. Okay, And within the transition metals, the group number varies between 3 and 12. Therefore, we can have between 3 and 12 valence electrons to consider. So um, what is the next step? Um, we count for the ionic charge if the species is not neutral. Okay, So when you have a complex cation, then you subtract the respective charges as the complex cation. And when you have a complex anion, you add the respective charges. So if you have a neutral complex, then there's nothing to do. So what is the third step? Now the third step requires to add the number of electrons contributed by the ligand. <clears throat> and now it's important to realize that this ligand needs to be a neutral ligand. Okay, so therefore, you must um, cleave the metal ligand bonds so that you create a neutral ligand, even though this um, um, neutral ligand doesn't make chemically um, a lot of sense, but still, formally, you have to do this, and then you have to um, add the um, electrons according. So this is uh, one of the disadvantages of the neutral atom method. Um, you have to think about how, how you have to cleave the metal ligand bond in order to produce a, a neutral <clears throat> ligand. The advantage is that you don't have to uh, think about oxidation states, which you have to do in the oxidation um, state method. So here's an example. Um, so here we look at a square planar platinum complex um, that has two chloroligands and two amine ligands. So what would be the number of the electrons in this uh, complex? So you apply step number one, 
then you have to write down the number of electrons of the neutral um, atom, okay, which can vary between three and 12. So we need to look at where platinum is located in the periodic table. So platinum is a group 10 element. So that means that it has a 10 valence electrons, S and D um, valence electrons added together. And so the number of electrons step one is therefore 10. So secondly, step B, would have to account for the ionic charge. And you'll see in this case, we have a neutral complex. Therefore, we do not have to add any electrons. We also do not have to um, subtract any electrons. Therefore, there's nothing to do in this case. Now, thirdly, and that's now the most complicated step, we have to add the number of the electrons contributed by the ligands, whereby we treat each ligand as a neutral ligand. So that means that we have to think about how we have to cleave the metal ligand bonds so that the ligands become neutral. Okay. So now how do we have to do this in this case? Let's first look at the chloral um, ligands. So in this uh, metal ligand bond, we have two electrons each. Now, in this case, we have to cleave the metal ligand bond homoleptically here in the middle and assign one electron to the platinum and the other electron to the chlorine. We have to do this for both metal ligand bonds. Why? Because only then we create a neutral ligand, which in this case is a chlorine atom, okay? If we assign both electrons to the chlorine, well, we would have a chloride anion as the ligand, and that would not be uh, a neutral ligand. So therefore we cannot do this in this case, even though chemically would make more sense if we consider uh, uh, chloro chlorine platinum bond, a dative bond in which these two electrons would be donated um, um, from the chlorine to the, to the platinum. Okay, so now what about um, the other two ligands, the amine ligands? Now in this case, we need to assign both the bonding electrons to the amine ligand. Because only in this case, we create a neutral ligand, which in this case would be an ammonia molecule. Okay. So now we know everything that we need to know, and we can just add up the electrons. So we said that the platinum contributes 10 electrons. So we do not have a charge to account for. So we have two chloral ligands that we treat as neutral chloral chlorine atoms contributing one electron each. That gives two times one is equal to two electrons. And then we have the two uh, amine ligands um, that as we previously said, contribute two electrons each. And that gives four electrons. And then gives, this gives 10 plus two plus four is equal to 16 electrons. Okay, so what if we use the other method, which is called the oxidation state method. So as the name says, um, this method assigns the metal in oxidation state and um, um, counts the electrons accordingly. So what would we do? What we need to do? Well, in the first step, again, we would write down the number of electrons in the neutral atom valence shell, which again can 
be between three and 12 according to the group number. So the first step in the oxidation state method is the same as the neutral atom method. However, now the next step is to determine the formal oxidation state of the metal. Okay. Um, so that will either reduce when the metal has a positive oxidation state, which is um, mostly the case, or um, increase when the metal has a negative oxidation state, which is not so common, but possible. Um, so increase the number of the electrons contribute to the metal accordingly. Okay. And now in the third step, you again add the number of the electrons contributed by the ligand, but now the ligand is not considered to be a neutral ligand anymore. It can be either a neutral ligand or it can be an anionic ligand. So in order to count the number of the electrons contributed by these ligands, in the oxidation state method, you always cleave the metal ligand bonds heteroleptically, okay? you assign all the bonding electrons to the ligands. So that's in a way more intuitive because uh, when you consider the metal ligand bond, uh, a dative bond where the bonding electrons all come to the, uh, come from the, from the ligands. So that's an advantage of the oxidation state method. The disadvantage is that you have to think about the oxidation state first. So now let us apply the oxidation state method to the same molecule. So first of all, we need to write down the number of electrons in the neutral atom. So we have again a platinum. So the number of electrons would be again 10. So next, we need to determine the formal oxidation state of the metal. So now how do we do this? Now we do this by assigning all the um, electrons in the metal ligand bonds to the ligand and see what formal charge arises at the ligand, okay? And then we take into account the overall charge at the uh, complex and derive from these two factors, the oxidation state of the platinum. So what would this mean in this case? Well, we would need to assign now both the, these two electrons here to the chlorine now that would make the chlorine a chloride, yeah? which has a one minus negative charge. So we have to account for two negative charges um, at the uh, chlorines. Now, when we look here at the amine ligands, then when we assign both electrons to the amine ligands, then that produces neutral NH3 molecules that do not carry a charge. So now you see that our complex uh, doesn't carry a charge overall. It's a neutral molecule. So therefore, in order to account for the two negative charges here at the chlorines, the platinum must carry a two plus positive charge so that the overall complex doesn't have a charge at all. And that means that the platinum must have the oxidation number plus two. So now you have determined the oxidation number of the metal and you subtract now two electrons accordingly because the platinum is the oxidation state plus two. So lastly, we need to add the number of the electrons contributed by the ligands. Now we have already assigned all the electrons to our ligands, okay? Therefore, how many electrons will these ligands contribute? 
Well, according to this, the two pleural ligands will contribute to each, and the two amine ligands will also contribute to each. So that gives overall eight contributed ligands, and eight contributed electrons coming from the ligands. Okay, so now let's sum this all up. So now um, the platinum, I'm sorry, this is a typo, here we have a platinum. Um, so the platinum has 10. So the oxidation state is plus two. So we are subtracting two electrons. And then the two chloral ligands contribute now two electrons each, that gives four. And the two nitrogens or the two amine ligands also contribute two electrons each, which gives another four. And if you sum this up, then this is 10 minus two plus four plus four, and that gives um, 16 electrons. Now, of course, the oxidation state method produces the same result as the neutral atom method. Okay, so these are the two um, methods. Um, let us practice um, these two methods um, a little bit further by um, counting the electrons um, in the ligands for the two methods, which is usually the most um, difficult um, step to do. So, for instance, when we have a hydrido ligand, an example for that would be uh, nona hydrido renate to minus. Then, when we look at the charge of the um, ligand using the neutral atom method, then in all, then that charge would necessarily always be zero because of the neutral atom method. So what about the oxidation state method? So determine the charge of the ligand using the oxidation state method. We would have to think about um, um, what charge at the at the ligand do we get if we cleave the metal ligand bond heteroleptically? Okay. So that we can assign well both electrons to the um, hydrogen. And you see that this produces an H minus anion. And therefore, well, the charge at the ligand would be minus one. Okay, so now what about the number of electrons contributed? So for the neutral atom method, we would have to think about, well, how do we have to cleave the metal ligand bond so that we are creating neutral fragments? So now in this case, we see that we have to cleave the metal ligand bond in the middle. Okay, homoleptically, and that produces then an hydrogen atom. Okay, and then the number of electrons donated is consequently one. So, what about the um, oxidation state method? How many electrons are donated? So, we previously saw that um, we have. A heteroleptically cleft bond. So we have an H minus anion, and that H minus anion would then contribute both electrons to the bond. So two electrons would be contributed. Okay, um, now a few more examples. Let's say we have a fluoroligand. Um, 
an example for that would be hexafluoroplatinate. What would be the charge in the neutral atom method? By the neutral atom method, as the name says, the charge is always zero. So what would be the charge at the oxidation state method? Okay. So now in the oxidation state method, we always cleave the bonds heteroleptically and assign all the bonding electrons to the ligand. So what do we produce? Well, we produce a fluoride anion, and therefore the charge is, well, minus one. So now how many electrons are donated in the neutral atom method? Now, for the neutral atom method, we said that um, we have, um, oh yeah, well, for the neutral atom method, we now have to think about how do we have to cleave the bonds to create a neutral fragment? So we have to cleave the bond in the middle because that creates a fluorine atom, which is neutral. And then how many electrons are being contributed? Well, it's exactly this one here. So we have one electron contribution. How many electrons are donated in the oxidation state method? Well, we said that we have cleft the bond heteroleptically. Okay. So as a consequence, we had assigned both of these electrons to the fluorine that made the fluorine a fluoride. Okay. And how many electrons would that fluoride contribute? Well, both of them, both of these bonding electrons. So we have again a two electron donor. Okay. Um, another example, which is a little bit more complicated. So let's say we have not a terminal Hydrogenide ligand, but a bridging hydrogenide ligand, because it's a new um, hydrogenide uh, ligand of the general description X. It could be either a fluorine, a chlorine, a bromine, or an iodine. Okay, so an example is uh, this here, where we have a rhodium complex in which two rhodium atoms are bridged by two chloro ligands. And there are two ethene ligands, uh, four ethene ligands in addition. So what would be the, would be the charge in the neutral atom method? Um, in the neutral atom method, the charge is always zero. What would be the charge in the oxidation state method? So we can determine this by cleaving the metal ligand bonds heteroleptically. So now in this case, you have two metal ligand bonds and you have to cleave them both heteroleptically so that you can assign all the bonding electrons to the ligand. So now which pieces would that create? Well, you see that this will create a chloride anion. So what is the charge? Well, the charge is minus one. So now let's think about the electrons donated first in the neutral atom method. So in order to determine the number of electrons donated, we need to see, well, how do we have to cleave the metal ligand bonds to create a neutral fragment? So in this case, you have two metal ligand bonds to consider. Okay, so now how do you have to cleave them? So you see in this case, you need to cleave one bond heteroleptically and uh, so this one heteroleptically and this homoleptically to produce a neutral chloroatom. Okay, so how many electrons are contributed? Well, it's this one and it's these two. And well, that's overall three. So in this case, we have the chlor ligand to be a 
free electron donor. What about the oxidation state method? So in the oxidation state method, we said we cleave the bonds heteroleptically. We have determined this order over here. This is just repeated over there. And we said that, well, according to this, our ligand is a chloride ligand. So this chloride ligand would now contribute well these one, two, three, four electrons. So we have a four electron donor in this case. Okay, um, here's an example, which is an alkoxide ligand. So for instance, uh, that alkoxide ligand can make a hexa alkoxy um power it to a minus uh, anion. So the number of charges in the neutral atom method would be zero as always. The charge in the oxidation state method would result when we cleave the bonds heteroleptically. In the oxidation state method, we always cleave the bond heteroleptically. That produces an alkoxide anion in the charge of minus one. So, what about the number of electrons donated? In the neutral atom method, we need to think about well, how do we have to cleave the metal ligand bond to create a neutral fragment? So, um, how do we have to do this? Can maybe any one of you tell me so that I'm not holding complete monologue over the time? You should have by now understood the principle. Can you cleave it homolytically between the two electrons? Correct. So only if we cleave the bond here in the middle, uh, we create an alkox alkoxy radical in this case and that would put you would contribute its radical electron okay so we would have one electron contributed so for the number of electrons donated in the oxidation state method then we previously are determined that we cleave the bond heteroleptically because we always do this this way in the oxidation state method that produced an alkoxide ion, which would now contribute, well, these two electrons to make the metal looking bond. So we have a two electron donor. Okay, um, a couple of more examples. Let's say we have a, <coughs> a carbonyl ligand, for instance, in the molecule. If, um, Iron pentacarbonyl, we have carbonyl ligands. What is the charge in the neutral atom method? Well, it's always zero. What is the charge in the oxidation state method? In this case, we need to cleave the metal ligand bond heteroleptically. Okay. So, what do we produce when we do this? We see that we produce a neutral carbon monoxide ligand yeah and therefore the charge is zero so what about the number of electrons contributed so in the neutral atom method we have to think about well how do we cleave the metal ligand bond in order to create a neutral fragment okay so can you tell me how we have to create Cleave the metal ligand bond. Heteroleptic. Sorry. Heteroleptically. Yeah. Correct. So in this case, we cleave the bond heteroleptically. Actually, there's a mistake. Um, um, this, this line needs to be over there. 
I have to correct this because only then we create, like over here, the uh, neutral carbon monoxide molecule. Yeah. Um, and how many electrons would then be contributed? Two, right? These two electrons. So note that in this case, you have a negative formal charge at the at the carbon, okay? But it's not the formal charge at the donor atom which is deciding, but the overall charge at the ligand. So that negative formal charge which you see at the carbon is actually compensated by the, the a positive formal charge of the oxygen. And that makes the ligand overall neutral. All right, now what about the oxidation state method? Um, we said previously, well, we cleave the bond heteroleptically as always to produce well, a neutral CO ligand. And then, of course, the number of electrons is also two electrons. So, in this case, in the case of the CO ligand, in both the oxidation state and the neutral atom method, we contribute the same number of electrons, namely two. Yeah. Okay, so here we have a little bit more an exotic. Um, ligand. So this is called an isonitrile um, ligand. So this nitrogen here is bound to an organic um, rest R, and we have here a formally negative charge at the carbon, and we have here a formally positive charge at the nitrogen. So this is called an isonitrile um, ligand. So uh, an example for that is this. Uh, molecule here where we have uh, iron um, complex with five um, isonitrile lists. So what is the charge? Uh, the charge is always zero in the neutral atom method. So um, what is the charge in the oxidation state method? So now we have to cleave the bonds heteroleptically again, as we always do. So what does that create? Okay. You see that this creates um, a neutral isonitrile. Okay. Note again that we have a formal negative charge here at the carbon, because the carbon is surrounded by one, two, three, four, five electrons, but that's not the deciding factor. The deciding factor is, well, what's the overall charge of the ligand? And the overall charge of the ligand is zero because the nitrogen here has a, has a formal positive charge, okay? Because it's surrounded by four electrons. One, two, three here, and one, which is part of the nitrogen carbon bond on the other side. Therefore, the charge is here, zero. So now what about the electrons donated in the neutral atom method? So how do we have to cleave the bond so that we are creating a neutral fragment? And well, in order to do this, and again, this is a mistake, just like over here, we have to cleave the bond heteroleptically, not homoleptically, in order to produce this neutral fragment because we have to assign these two electrons both to the carbon, only then the, new, um, the fragment will be neutral. So therefore, these two electrons will be donated and according to the neutral atom method, the isonitrile ligand would be a two electron donor. Last but not least, <coughs> we have the oxidation state method and the number of electrons donated to consider. We previously said we cleave the bond heteroleptically, then we create well that um, neutral fragment here, and we would have two electrons to be donated. 
also. So again, also in this example, the number of electrons contributed is the same in both methods. Okay, um, so now you may ask, well, why is this electron counting actually important? Okay. And electron counting is important because the number of electrons in the uh, complex um, has a great influence on the stability of this complex. So as a rule, um, complexes with 18 electrons are um, the most stable. Um, any elect uh, any uh, complexes that have less um, than 18 electrons um, are called uh, coordinatively unsaturated. So these complexes tend to add electrons. So that means that can relatively easily be, be reduced or they add um, ligands in order to compensate for the lack of electrons. So therefore, these complexes tend to have a higher reactivity in comparison to 18 electron complexes. So vice versa, when you have more than 18 electrons, the respective complexes also tend to be more reactive. They are then coordinatively oversaturated and they tend to either lose ligands to lose electrons or um, lose electrons by oxidation. Okay, so both is associated with enhanced um, a reactivity. Um, so the 18 electron rule is called a rule because there are well, many exceptions to them, but one can also explain these exceptions in many cases. Um, so for instance, um, there are many exceptions for group three and four transition metal complexes. And there are many exceptions for group 10 metal complexes. It doesn't mean there can be also exceptions for the complexes of other groups, but they tend to be less um, common. So let us think about why um, group three and four metal complexes um, tend to violate the 18 electron rule. So let us look at this compound first and let us um, determine what is the number of electrons in this complex. We can either use the oxidation state method or the neutral atom method. So for instance, let's start out with the neutral atom method. So the first step would be to determine the number of valence electrons the metal would contribute. Can you tell me how many electrons the metal would contribute? So in which group is the titanium? Uh, it's group four. Group four, then how many electrons do we have? Four. Four, correct. Okay. So the next step in the neutral atom method is um, to determine the a charge at the complex and then add and subtract electrons accordingly. So we see that this complex is a neutral molecule 
So we don't have to add or subtract any charges. So therefore step two is easy. Now step three requires that we determine how many electrons the ligands add. So therefore you have to first think about how do we have to cleave the metal ligand bonds in order to create, well, a neutral ligand. Can you tell me how you have to cleave it? Homoleptically. Homoleptically, that's that's mm -hmm. correct. Because <clears throat> then you create a neutral uh, organic radical, correct? Um, that would contribute then how many electrons? Four. Um, well, overall, there would be four, but each ligand will contribute one, right? And because we have yeah. four ligands, we would contribute overall four. Right. So therefore, we have now determined that four electrons come from the metal and four electrons come from the ligands all together. Now, what does that give? Well, we have well four plus four, that gives eight. Yeah? So we could also use the oxidation state method and then the metal would again contribute four, but the oxidation number of titanium would be plus four because if we assign both electrons um, in the metal ligand bonds to the ligand, each ligand would get a one negative charge. Because we would have to compensate for four negative charges and that assigns the oxidation number of plus four to the titanium, okay, so four minus four plus, well now, four times two electrons, that gives eight, okay? And that gives eight electrons. So this is now the oxidation state method, which is complementary to the neutral atom method, which just practice together. So now you see that's far below 18. So now, um, why would the complex be happy and stable despite having, well, so many less electrons? The answer is um, to go to 18 electrons would either require that we add 10 electrons to this complex, and then our complex would have a 10 negative charge. And so many charges at the complex is just not possible just because there's too much electron electron repulsion that would stabilize, that would destabilize the complex. The other method would be to add more ligands in order to go to 18 electrons. Okay. But how many ligands of this kind would we have to add to get to 18 electrons? Well, if we consider each um, um, ligand, a two electron donor, then that would be at least four more ligands, okay? And that would give a, coordin uh, that would give a coordination number of eight, which is unreasonably high. Okay, therefore, in this case, an 18 electron complex wouldn't be stable because, well, the metal has just so few D electrons. And in this, in this case, it therefore violates the 18 electron rule and makes a complex which has far less many um, electrons. Okay, so for the same arguments, we could also explain why group three metal ions tend to violate the 18 electron rule. So now for group 10 um, metals, we cannot apply this method because 
10 electrons are a lot of electrons, a lot of D electrons. So there must be, there must be another reason. So um, let us count the electrons in a um, D10 um, metal complex, for instance, this one here. So we encountered this electron uh, complex order previously, and we said, well, um, we have these two amine ligands and we have these two chloral ligands. If we um, apply, for instance, again, the neutral atom method, these chloral ligands would contribute one electron each. These amine ligands would contribute two each. That would give six. And the palladium is a group 10 metal that would contribute 10 electrons so that would give 16 okay so you have 10 um there's no charge the electrons at the chlorine would be two and the electrons by the ligands would be four over all that would give 16. so now in this case we can explain the violation of the 18 electron by the um, shape of the complex. So uh, group 10 metals with D8 ions, as we said before, tend to make the square planar shape. And in square planar shaped, in square shaped uh, complexes, there's a tendency that 16 electrons are favored over 18 electrons. So why this is not um, immediately clear, we would have to look more closely at the bonding within complexes in, in order to understand why certain complexes um, like, like this one um, prefers 16 electrons, for instance, over 18 electrons. So in order to do this, um, um, we need to look more closely into bonding theories for coordination compounds. And this is now what we were looking at um, next. Um, but I see we are at the end of the class today and we'll start with bonding and coordination chemistry then in the next class. Um, but for now we can stop the recording.